everyone, I am Rebecca from Chemnitz. And today we are gonna leave no dye behind and we're gonna use up, I don't know why in my head I thought there was gonna be a green, but we've got purples <laughs> and pink here today. I think this might be some midnight blue. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this is fluorescent fuchsia and I'm pretty sure that this is electric violet. I might be wrong though. <laughs> There's a big chance I'm wrong. But we're gonna use these colors to create uh, some colors on some yarn. I think I'm just gonna go for some tonals today. Uh, I've pre-soaked a bunch of yarn here. I have both Knit Picks Swish DK, which is 100% Superwash Merino wool, and Knit Picks Stroll Fingering Weight Yarn, 75% Superwash Merino, 25% Nylon. If you want to learn more about any of the tools and equipment and dye and the, my favorite things for using to add color to yarn, I have links and affiliate links down in the video description, and I may earn a commission if you make a purchase through a link. But anyway, let's go to some leftover dye baths <laughs> that I have. I have two leftover dye baths over here uh, that have slightly different color in them tw at the end. Both of them had 20 cups of water plus, gosh, eight or nine or more tablespoons of white vinegar. And what I'm doing right now is working on some of this dye that was around this rim. Uh, Cause I'd like to avoid transfer, but the best way to remove this color right now would be to uh, use soap and I wanna reuse the dye bath. So I'm just doing a little bit of a scrub and well, we'll see what happens. Okay, I'm coming over with between 60 and 65 milliliters of this pink dye. The reason why I measured it is because I wanted to make sure that I did not use too little yarn. This pink is a known bleeder, and well, you know, that's not what I want <laughs> today. I don't want uh, to have to deal with washing and washing and washing. So, we're still gonna have a bright sort of fluorescent tonal here. I added in the dye, turned on the heat again, and I'm gonna grab some yarn. Normally when I'm dyeing yarn, I try to remove the yarn from a pre-soak before I touch dye, and you can see why. I got a little bit of color on there. And now I'm gonna come in with my, oh my gosh, I must have had so much dye on my fingertips, with 200 grams of the Swish DK yarn. And you can see that with, what, a third of a gram of dye per 100 grams of yarn, we have a bright, bright pink color. Uh, and a color that, even though the dye bath has a lot of acid in it, this color is very, very likely to be very uh, solid overall, just because, just because of the way things are. Wow. My, my speech is doing great today. The color is likely to be very, very solid here um, because, and I keep forgetting that I have dye in there. Um, good news, I'm not getting a ton of transfer back on there. Uh, this is a color that spreads. It does not strike quickly, and so we should get really good coverage on our yarn. Okay, and now we'll go over to the other dye bath, which is also slightly warm and at one point had 20 cups of water, but I don't think it has that much water in it anymore. Um, interesting. Running around, I see a little bit of brown at the edge. Believe it or not, the two pots had the exact same amount of dye, the exact same color. They just had different fiber contents in there. And it's very possible that you're seeing this video before that video. So uh, put a guess about what I might have been using down in the comments below. All right, now I'm not gonna measure the colors this time, but with this purple that I believe is midnight blue, we definitely have less than 100 milliliters based on how full this container was. I'm gonna guess 30 to 40 milliliters. Okay, and then here we are with our other color where I would say we could have 100 milliliters. It's nice, pretty purpley color. I'm feeling really amused right now because when I was prepping for this and picking yarn bases, I remember thinking, gee, I have um, green, purple, and pink, but there's no green. <laughs> so 
Oh man. All right, well for this color, I'm gonna go with the Stroll Fingering Weight yarn. And ooh, ooh. This color right now, as I turn on the heat, uh, this color is giving me, well, it's certainly binding way uneven. Uh, check that out. I mean, we have a lot of acid in here and you're gonna see We've almost absorbed all of that color when I believe we had more milliliters, although that purple in that container may not have been a 1% stock solution. I was not expecting this to be blue. That purple must not have had a lot of pigment in it. Uh, that purple must have been from when I was trying to make a pastel and so it must have just had a little bit of color. Oh my gosh, this is pretty. I want more though. <laughs> oh, what am I gonna do? Okay, I'm gonna remove this yarn. We're not that warm yet. I mean, this is a really pretty tonal. I mean, I really don't mind it. I just thought that I was gonna be doing a purple today. I was debating going and getting more color, but you know what? I love it. It's a very pretty blue tonal. <laughs> the dye bath is almost cleared. And we're gonna go with it. Even though a big part of me is wanting to run upstairs to where I have dye stocks, grab some electric violet, which I definitely have a dye stock of, and add more color so we get a purple here, I think that this Leave No Dye Behind is gonna give us a really nice comparison. Because yes, I think there's less pigment in here overall, but things struck really, really fast uh, with the amount of acid we have. And that dye bath is looking clear. We're still gonna heat this for 30 minutes, uh, but we're close. <laughs> we know what this is gonna look like. And in contrast, our Swish DK, which is a base that absorbs color as fast as the Stroll does, is a bright pink in a sea of more pink. <laughs> And so different dyes, different pigments absorb at different rates uh, and you can get different kinds of effects. It would be really hard to get the effect we got on that blue tonal with this dye because it's just the way that this particular color works. But anyway, we're going to heat both of them for 30 minutes from the time the dye baths get nice and hot. This is why you label your dye stocks. You label them with the concentration because I knew what was in that container was a purple and I assumed it was a 1% stock solution, but it wasn't. I'm pretty sure what was in the small bottles were some leftover 1% stock solutions, but again, I can't entirely be sure because I didn't label them and without a label, it's hard to know. And so this is why I recommend if you're gonna be keeping dye stocks and saving them, label them with the color name, the uh, concentration. So I label things typically as a percent. So what I should have had it said is like a 1% dye stock, which would be one gram of dye per 100 milliliters of liquid, which is usually the most, the, I don't usually mix things at a higher concentration than that, but if I had that information, it would be a lot easier for me to do two things. One, uh, know the color that was there and how much dye I had so I could plan for a project. But two, it would allow me to create something that had some reproducibility to it. Uh, and with either of these, without having like more concrete numbers, if I wanted to color match it, it would be harder to do that. But that's one of the reasons why I do these Leave No Dye Behind videos, because sometimes, there are dyes that I just have that I'm like, oh, I haven't used up, it's been a while, and I don't remember what it is. I think I know what it is, but sometimes I'm wrong. <laughs> now, one thing I did with these dyes that I do not recommend is I had them sitting in a secondary container, which I showed at the beginning, that I do recommend, but I had it sitting on a shelf that gets direct sunlight, and I don't recommend that. Uh, I always tend to do a sniff test of the dyes because if it were to smell spoiled, then I definitely would not use it. Um, if it smells like dye, I mean, I don't like hover my nose over it, but I just, 
if something smells off, you know when you open it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I, it's still, it's best to store them out of direct sunlight in a dark place because then you limit what if anything could grow in there um, and spoiling. But I have had dye stocks that have lasted a very, very long time. Well, there was one time I noticed like a huge difference in the color. That was with a stock solution when I mixed all 40 Jacquard Offset dyes together and I had a dye stock for a while and the color sh completely shifted after a year. Uh, so it's possible that there's some pigments that will break down in solution for a long period of time, but I haven't attempted to reproduce that result or anything. So anyway, for the most reproducible results, <laughs> If you want reproducible results with your tonals, I recommend mixing the dyes fresh. Then you know exactly how much you used. And with age, sometimes dyes will crash out of solution and solids will sort of sink to the bottom. And so if it's not well mixed, you could have less dye when you're pouring from the top and then more dye the more empty the container gets, which isn't what you want either. So for the best, most reproducible results, mix it fresh. But if you just want to play with color, having some colors in dye stocks isn't a bad thing. It just means that I go for similar colors and videos over and over again, because sometimes I'm more inclined to reach for colors I already have mixed to try to use those up before going for like and mixing a new color. Of course, then there's a time like today where I have something left over at the end of a day of dyeing and I didn't have a chance to do a quick leave no dye behind as part of a video and so then I have things and I'm like well I do want to use these. Now the in the tulip tie-dye bottles those two colors I did use for the scribble dyeing so I'm pretty sure I knew what those colors were because I was pretty sure I decided what they were back then but anyway <sighs> those are some thoughts but it's fun to create colors and I knew I was going to make a neon pink DK. That was something that I don't have currently in stock in my shop. <laughs> I don't know if I have something similar to the more blue tonal yet. Uh, I may. Uh, and so I may regret not using DK on that as well. Sometimes I do pick the colors and the yarn base for a video based on the colors that I currently have in my shop stock. Uh, so that way I can have like a range of different colors. But anyway. I'm gonna go check on Indy, and when my timer goes off, we'll be back and we'll look at the yarn. But while you wait, uh, go and check out the yarn in the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop. It's full of hand-dyed yarn that has been featured in my videos, and buying some of that yarn is a great way to help support all of the content here. And thank you for, be pa for being patient with Indy trying to get my attention, which I'm gonna go give him now. <laughs> it's been 30 minutes. And I'm expecting, we have a lot of pink in the water. I'm unsure if this was really that little dye, but um, I'm gonna let this heat, I think for 15 more minutes with you know it being near a boil, and then I'm gonna turn off the heat and leave this in here to cool off completely. And I'll probably do the rest of that off camera. As for our blue, I'm turning off the heat now because, well, before we even really started heating uh, the dye bath was clear and I'm only gonna leave it in the pot because that's what's easiest right now uh, normally I would go ahead and just remove this and set it aside to cool completely but since I have stuff going on in the other pot may as well just wait <laughs> let it cool slowly and I'll remove it uh, in a little bit an hour or so later things are much cooler in the pot but we definitely still have color. I will say this is feeling very, very vibrant. <laughs> but I'm going to set it aside so it can cool completely. And as for our other pot, uh, which you can't see to the bottom of right now, but I can say that you know it was clear because it was clear before. <laughs> we are also going to set this aside to cool. Let's wash the yarn that we think will be a bleeder first, because why not? <laughs> oh, fluorescent fuchsia, hot fuchsia, whichever color it was. It is a color that is bright, it's beautiful, but it is a bleeder. 
I do technically have a warning in all of my listings so like some colors could bleed depending on like heat or something uh, and I do recommend washing yarn uh, on its own if it's, hand, or if it's super wash the first few washes and stuff but always wash hand dyed yarn in cold water hot water can definitely cause more bleeding but actually for something this pink that is not bad not bad at all all right i'm gonna rinse out the soap now do, do, do. oh sometimes it's a little bit of soap but we're looking really good so into the spin dryer we go and we can wash our next yarn here we go with our quite blue yarn i mean we definitely have a little bit of electric violet in there i think most is midnight blue but this is a very very blue i don't think i guess i get i guess i thought that midnight blue would be very purple at a low depth of shade but you know maybe i've often used it on top of something that was already purple or pink so there we go but there's nothing actually i don't know why i'm throwing away that water we can add our tiny bit of soap here I could have washed all four stains together, but given that I knew one was more likely to be a bleeder, it made more sense to wash it separately just to show you guys. But this is a very pretty, very subtle colorway with no bleeding. So I'm going to finish rinsing out the soap, put all this yarn into my spin dryer, and hang it up to dry. Our pink tonal is I would say almost more of a semi-solid. It's possible that there will be some variation when it's knit with, but this color strikes so slowly overall that, yeah, we have really, really good coverage. I was scouring to look to see if there's any color transfer, and there's some super, super subtle, I don't know if you can see it on camera, blues, but the pink really does outshine everything. Whereas our blue yarn is way more of a tonal. These colors struck fast. Uh, sure, things might be a little bit, quote, patchier, but that isn't a bad thing. We have random tonal variation. Some of the patches are big enough that you could end up with some micro, micro striping, depending on the type of project. But for all, there's a lot more tonal variation in here. It doesn't make it more or less beautiful than the pink, just extremely different for being a kettle dyed yarn, for being two examples of kettle dyed yarn. I didn't even intend for this video to be a different effects on kettle dyed yarn depending on the dye, but I don't even think that's what I'm going to title this video. I don't know what I'm going to title this video, but that is sort of what we got. Uh, we have, you know, in a very similar techniques, similar dye baths that both were left over. <laughs> uh, we have two different types of kettle dyed yarn. Now, in both of these examples, I would still recommend alternating rounds um, every couple of rows or rounds when you're knitting with something, if you're making something larger, because the variation you could get skein from skein is a little easier to understand with the blue more tonal yarn than it is with the pink that is more solid, but there could be some subtle differences in the pink and you don't want to have like a sharp demarcation line when you go from one skein to another. So that is just a recommendation that I make. It may not be a big deal, but you never know. I am Rebecca from Chemnitz, and I hope you enjoyed this video. I have been meaning to do a uh, different types of kettle dyeing yarn type video at some point again, uh, and so maybe I will do one with more planning than what went into today's video, even though today's video did give us some really beautiful results. Uh, please subscribe, turn on notifications, and head over to the Chemnitz Creations Etsy shop to pick up some hand dyed yarn. You can get some pretty yarn and support the content here at the same time. But if you have too much yarn, which I hesitate to even say, there are other ways that you can contribute to the channel. I have a Patreon. You can join to become a channel member. Um, but really, subscribing is the biggest thing that you can do. Thank you so much for watching.